Salam Tana Tena Yisterling. Greetings. Ne Arasi, I renounce Tesari Nay. Let's deal with a subject matter that is very, very important. It's near and dear to our heart, and it's the true etymology of the name Ethiopia or Ethiopia. No doubt you have heard it said, and it's been often repeated, that, well, the name Ethiopia is actually Greek. This is what you've heard. This is what you've been led to believe. Um, even many Ethiopians have been led to believe that the name of their country, uh, Ethiopia, and we have it here, Ethiopia, 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 is actually of Greek um, derivation. In other words, one of the most ancient and long-lived of peoples had to wait until the Greeks came along to give them a name. Now, how ridiculous, how silly, how foolish is that? There's absolutely no truth that the original derivation of the name Ethiopia comes because some Greeks saw people and they call them Athen Ops. In other words, burnt faces or burnt eyes. Literally, it means burnt opes, like opes as an optic, you understand, burnt opes. This is the so-called Greek um, story. This is the Greek narrative concerning the name Ethiopia. However, some of us have sought to study it and do the etymology and, and to devote ourselves to, to finding out is it really true that the name Ethiopia um, was derived for, from some anonymous Greeks that, that came along and saw this, this beautiful um, bronze and ebony people and, and said that, oh, the, the sun have kissed them, the sun have burnt them, and that's the reason why they are who... And we will name them Athen Ops. And then we'll contract that to say Ethiops. We'll take out the N from Athen, which means to burn in Greek, and we'll call them Athenops people. That's ridiculous. That is totally ridiculous. That's foolish. That's a lie. And, and, and there's, there's, there's no truth to it. The only truth to it is that it has been told and retold. And, and it's like 85% of most of the... So-called scholars have got it wrong, 80, probably maybe even more than 85% of those who have written on the subject, both in past times and even in present times, because most of them are relying on what those in so-called past times, mostly Europeans, you understand. But certain Ethiopians know what we're about to say is true. And it's sad and unfortunate that more don't know it, but hopefully more will get to know what's the true etymology and the true root of the name Ethiopia is not from the Greeks, is not from outside or pharynge or pharyngoch, but actually it comes from the Bible, it comes from the scripture, it's the Bible that's at the root of this. And let's get our, let's get our pens and paper and scripture. We have our... Um, Webster's, what we've spoken about, the Webster's uh, Collegiate Dictionary right here, the Webster's College Dictionary. And in this, I think it's the third edition, it says Ethiop, archaic, Ethiopian, then Ethiopia says ancient kingdom, possibly dating to the 10th century B.C. in northeast Africa on the Red Sea um, because of the Eritrea situation and the border situation and it, they've lost that, that, that border on the Red Sea, so Ethiopia today is actually landlocked. But still, it's corresponding to um, modern Sudan and North Ethiopia, the country. And a, a word we should make mention of, since hopefully this will be going up on our channel, Ethiopian World Net, on the YouTubes um, fairly soon, um, that um, it's, it's a beautiful thing that now there is a Christian nation, a Christian country that is bordering on um, Ethiopia. In other words, southern Sudan. Southern Sudan is the, the, the newest nation in the world. 
and it's really part of this greater Ethiopia. It's part of the greater Ethiopia, and we hope and we pray, and time will tell, but we hope and we pray that our brothers and sisters in southern Sudan um, get to know that our, our prayers and hopefully our assistance in the now, but more so in the future, will be with them to help them secure and build this greater Ethiopia, because this is all prophecy. But we just thought about that when we looked at the definition that they give here in the Webster's uh, Dictionary, stating that it corresponds, Ethiopia corresponds to modern Sudan and North Ethiopia, the country, the country in East Africa on the Red Sea established, they say here, in 1855. And there's a lot of wrestling over those matters. Now, when we go further and we find um, Ethiopian, it says Ethiopian of people, um, of Ethiopia, its people or culture. Then it says archaically, in brackets, says black. Archaically, to say Ethiopian is black, but really what they deleted from these dictionaries, and we can show you some older dictionaries, when you look up Ethiopia, you find Negro. You understand? And Negro is defined as Ethiopian. Many native Ethiopians probably don't know this part of the story because this is our part of the story. The lost sheep know this part of the story. The once lost but now found sheep, we know this part of the story. This is why we identify ourselves as Ethiopian. Ethiopia is, but more so was, an empire. You understand? Ethiopia was an empire that stretched from sea to sea, you understand, from ocean to ocean, from water to water, wherever water touches land in ancient times, you find Ethiopians there. Tacitus said in 70 AD, the Roman historian, that the Jews are of the race, the true Jews or the true Hebrews or Judahites are of the race of the Ethiopians. So there's a lot of testimony in history that make the, the enemies um, the disbelievers, the unbelievers, the heathen, that makes them angry when they, when, when they see this great divine heritage that we have, and especially that we claim this in this present time as Ethiopian Hebrews, or as black Hebrews, or black Jews, so forth and so on. But the more accepted um, nomenclature for us are, is as Ethiopian Hebrews. Now, it says that it's black in the archaic sense, and you can see that in the Negro sense, designating of or of the biogeographic realm that includes, that includes Madagascar and all of Africa, except some parts of North Africa and uh, Pele, Pele Arctic realm. Now, in this Webster's Dictionary, we might take a snapshot and do another video or at least take a snapshot so at least we can have the evidence and ones can, you know, um, text it to their friends and, and their study partners. That it says in this dictionary right here under Ethiopian, it says of Ethiopia, it's people or culture, firstly. Second, it says archaically black, and we know that it's capital black. You look that up and there's a vis-a-vis -vis relation to Negro, and they only call us black today. You know, because we struggle to be identified as black today, but before they called us Negroes and coloreds and, and a lot of other derogatory um, names that were not our own. However, in the sense of negro, negro, it means black. Negro means black in Spanish and Portuguese. Portuguese. So it's all connected right there. So in this sense, Ethiopian means black. And it says designating the third um, entry is, or the third uh, definition, should we say, is designating or of the biogeographic realm that includes Madagascar and all of Africa except some parts of North Africa in the Palearctic realm. So this dictionary, a modern dictionary, is, is, is even saying that Ethiopia in the full sense, when we say that Ethiopia is, was, and will be an empire. Ethiopian ancient time was an empire. You know what I'm saying? An empire. That means it was bigger than just the one so-called small country 
You understand that you see on the map today, and even that small country is a big country. But it's more than just those artificial borders that you see when they talk about Ethiopia today. It's it's more than that. So it's very important. It's very important for us to understand understand that. And this definition here says that biogeographically is the realm that includes Madagascar and all of Africa, Ethiopian, all of Africa. Then it says as a noun, a native or inhabitant of Ethiopia. Secondly, the second um, um, definition has a bracket, open bracket, archaic, closed bracket, a black person. So a black person is an Ethiopian. What's the interesting, if you see that movie Under Siege with Denzel Washington, if you see that movie Under Siege with Denzel Washington, the scene there, I think it has, um, 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 who's that, uh, who's that other actor that's, that's in the movie? Um, uh, and anyway, the other white guy, the white guy in the movie says to Denzel Washington, he says to him, um, I'll call you an Ethiopian. I'll say you're an Ethiopian. And Denzel said something to the effect of, and, and you're dumb enough to think that that's an insult. You understand? That was a very good scene in Under Siege. So I call it, we call that the Ethiopian scene. You got to check it out, so forth and so on. But now, the next word that follows up after we've touched on Ethiop, Ethiopia, Ethiopian, now we're going to touch on Ethiopic. Touch on Ethiopic. And here's where we get to the etymological brackets, where it says derived from the Latin Aethiopicus, Aethiopicus, as derived from the Greek Aethiopicus, and they say that's derived from Aethiopes, Ethiopian. And literally, they say it means with burnt face from the word, the Greek word Athen, Athen, you understand, to burn. And then it says see Etha. Or ether, see ether, see the ether, see ether. Very interesting right there. And we'll touch on that in another portion. Plus it says oops, 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 face. Then it has in caps I, E-Y-E, I. Firstly, the connotative definition says Ethiopian in full caps. Secondly, it says designating or of the what does it say right there? Semitic languages of the Ethiopians. Of designating or of the Semitic languages of the Ethiopians. So it's important to understand that when we say Ethiopia, we're saying Ethiopia in the sense of Shem. You understand? What is called the so-called um, Sem. You understand? Or the name. You understand the name. And what's interesting is that Within the Ethiopic, we have the word uh, Seyum, and it's related to Seyum Egeziyave here, one of the titles of his imperial majesty, which is interpreted as the elect of God, or the Shem, the Shem, the name of God, the elect of God, Seyum. So we have Shem, same, Shem, but important enough is that it says that Ethiopic, you understand, is a Shemitic language of the Ethiopians. You understand? Um, this is the classical Shemitic language of Ethiopia. Still used as the liturgical or holy Kedus, Kedase language of the Christian church in Ethiopia. Secondly, it's a group of Semitic or Shemitic languages spoken in Ethiopia including classical Ethiopic. So a very important thing we're learning, there's this relationship now that's established both in the language that the people speak to Shem, and therefore Sem in the sense of Semitic, and prophetically the Shiyum or Seyume Egeziyavi has the elect of God, Kedemawi Haile Selassie. But now the true etymology of Ethiopia you understand, is not to be found the original, not the byproduct, not the connotation. You see, when people believe today that the meaning of Ethiopia means burnt face, this is the connotation. What we're touching on right here now is the etymology. The etymology of Etopia is from the Tobia, Tobia, the Tobia, 
which biblically is called the land of Tob, or the to you, the Tob, the Tob, as in Hebrew. Some pronounce this word as Tob, enforced Hebrew today, run and controlled by the Ashkenazi and, and, and their new rules for Hebrew, or for their Yiddishized Hebrew, they call this, they say Tov, Tov. So you might have heard or seen this in the studies, T-O-V. They call this Tov. They mispronounce it as Tov because in, in their form of speech, the Ashkenazis, you understand, they favor this Germanic, the German, you understand, the German and the Polish Jews favor this V sound, you understand, because it's similar to their European languages. So they pervert their Hebrew to, you know, favor the way that they like to speak. But in true biblical Hebrew, it's called Tob, Tob, you understand? And we have the archaic name for Ethiopia or Ethiopia is Tobia. So before the Greeks started to tell stories, you understand, the Greeks started to tell stories. They were good, good storytellers, myth makers. So they would, well, they started to tell these stories concerning um, this particular people that they had met. And remember, they never tell you where they met them. They don't tell you if they met them in Egypt, if they met them in in, in Sewen or in in, in in Aswan, or whether they met them in Meroe, or whether they met them in Eritrea, or whether they met them in the highlands, in Shashimani. Where did they meet these Ethiopians? They just said that they met these Ethiopians, and they started calling them this name. You understand? And they interpreted it. Because it made sense to them when they heard Tobia, you understand? When they heard Tobia, it made sense to them. In their language, they interpreted this in the Greek, which the Greeks learned from the Egyptians, black people, you understand? Afro-Asiatic people, they learned their language from the Egyptians and a point of, a point of, um, a point of order. And we'll get into the details on this as well, that... Um, that Coptic was before Greek, modern Greek. You understand, the modern European Greeks learned the main art of speech from the Ionians and the Coptic people who are a people of the Saba or the Sheba. They are people of Sheba. So the Queen of Sheba and the Sabians and the ancient Copts or Cabetians were related. You understand? And one of their colonies was the Ionian colony, was what they call Greek today. This is why, you know, when you start to look at um, the Minoans, they talk a lot about the Minoans, and you can see it in some of their art, where they, they were black, you understand, and they were white. In other words, they were light-skinned, and they were dark-skinned, you understand? So they were a very interesting and a unique people, which also mirrors very much the ancient Ethiopians or Adam and Eve. You understand the Asai Damara and the Aye Damara, but that's that's another another particular issue dealing with the Afars. The Afars. The Bible says and man was made from the dust of the land. But in truly interpreting that the Ophar, the Ophir, Ophir is a land, it's a country. Afar. So it was from the Ophir, you understand, which was a part of this empire of Tobia or ancient Ethiopia, Ethiopia. So the true etymology for the name Ethiopia is not from the Greek. The Greek is a latter day connotation, you understand, of Tobia. And Tobia is the archaic name for what we know today as Ethiopia or Ethiopia. And in the Bible, we have this as there's a place called the land of Tob. The land of Tob. Now, the first reference or the first mention, let's write this right here. The first reference or the first mention to a place known as um, Ethiopia is in Genesis is in Genesis two and thirteen. Genesis two and thirteen. And here it reads 
it says, and the name of the second river is Gihon, or Bamarinya in the Ethiopic, uh, uh, Gion, or Gion, you know what I'm saying, Gion, the name, the same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Now, a lot of folks have tried to figure this out and tried to really put all this together, but first we have to look to the author. Who was the original author of this book here that we have, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch? It was our Coptic Hebraic brother Musa, or Moshe. So Moshe, Moses, the Bible says in Acts 7.22, and let's get this right here, in Acts 7.22, it tells us very definitively that Moses was learned, you understand, in the wisdom of, in other words, that means that he was educated, you understand, in the ancient universities, the, the temple university of Anu, you understand, in Egypt. And he was also educated in certain highland universities as well. And one of his main educators, you understand, the one who taught him was his Ethiopian wife's father or his father-in-law. So here in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it says that, And Musa, Moses, was learned in all the wisdom, the Tibet, you understand, the Tibet, which is to say the wisdom. It's like we talk about going to college and getting an education today. This was the Tibet. This was the Hokmah. This was the wisdom schools, you understand, was the place to go for such in those days and time. It says the wisdom of the Egyptians. Yet that's incorrect to say the Egyptians. It should say the wisdom of the Egypts. But King James and them thought not to translate it as the wisdom of the Egypts because they thought that would be too confusing for people. And then it would bring up a lot of questions. People would be like, well, how many Egypts are there? You understand? And that, those were questions that they were not ready to answer. And they thought that it worked better in their conception, the translators of King James Bible, to say the wisdom of the Egyptians. But if you do a study on this verse, you will find out that it, it's, it's actually the wisdom of the Egypts. You understand? The Egypts. The Egypt that we know as, as, as Lower Egypt and the Egypt that we know as Upper Egypt that reaches to those highlands that we call Ethiopia today. But it's significant that it says, and Moses was mighty in words. It says, and indeed, or more correctly, in word and deed. Sometimes King James makes something plural when it should be singular, and sometimes singular when it should be plural. Unfortunately, this is what we have discovered in diligent side-by-side -side studies of the King James Bible and the King of Kings Bible, and we make these notes. So some, some places you might feel it's, it's, it's like as if it were, but something is missing, and those nuances there are very significant. So there's some corrections that need to be made, you understand, in our former understanding as we come to overstanding. So Moses was the author of the first five books called the Pentateuch, called the Ori, the Torah, and, and, and called today by um, nowadays Jews or converted Jews, they call it Tanakh. I, I try to warn the brothers and sisters, even though the Tanakh is an acronym standing for the Torah, the Nabim, and the Ketubim, that is not biblical in the sense that it's taken today. And if you go into to the scripture and you look up Tanakh, you will find that Tanakh is associated with false gods. So it's interesting that the converted Jews would bring this idea of Tanakh from an acronym, but if you look up Tanakh as though it's a Hebrew word, in the scriptures you will find a very curious association with that. So make a note of that. We prefer to call the five books either the Pentateuch, either to call it the, the Orit, you understand, or Torah. You understand, the Torah, the first five books, instead of calling it the Tanakh in that sense, although we will use it, use this, this quote end quote so that those who are familiar with it will know exactly what we are referring to, but put that as a footnote there. So when it's talking about um, the Garden of Eden and talking about the Eden, people get confused. Some people say that Ethiopia was the Garden of Eden. No, Ethiopia was part of that Eden. 
You know, saying Ethiopia was part of that. Ed, and we just read what the Webster's Dictionary said was the territory of Ethiopia. They said that it encompassed Madagascar and all of Africa, except for certain northern regions, certain regions over here, over there. You understand? So it kind of shows you when you read this text. But what confuses folks is that the way the, the map is today is not the same as it was when this first was recorded. You understand? Either in the time of Moses, but moreover, Moses was in the in, in, in uh, initiate in the, for lack of a better word, the mystery schools or secret societies. But he was in the universities of higher learning and education, and he got to look at the creation scrolls. You understand? He got to understand these creation sc scrolls, especially when he recognized who Yahweh is and who Yahweh even was, and how there were certain true God worshipers, you understand, who were Egyptians. Not all Egyptians worshipped the false priesthood gods that came in later on. So what we find in Egypt was, people look at Egypt as though it was stagnant. You understand, there was, e e Egyptian religion became like Catholicism is today, where you have a lot of people who would say that, yeah, I'm Catholic. You understand? Although they don't understand, they say I was born Catholic. They was born into it, so they went along with the customs, the ceremonies, the traditions, so forth and so on, because family and others were a part of it, some of them more zealously. But they went along with this, like when Thanksgiving and Easter and all these heathenish kind of holidays come up on, on the Western calendar, Labor Day, Memorial Day, um, all these kind of Fourth of July. You understand? People who go and they follow along, though they don't know anything about where these holidays come from and what they really signify. You understand? Or, and if false gods are not somehow involved in that. But suffice it to say, we're not going to talk about exactly where the Garden of Eden was, but it, it says that he planted a garden eastward in Eden. So all of Eden wasn't the garden, and the garden wasn't all of Eden, but eastward. So what's interesting is that as, as, as we go east from Ethiopia and east from Africa, we indubitably have to reach Babylon and have to reach before Babylon the desert, but moreover Babylon where the hanging gardens and where even archaeology shows. But the, the river lines that it's speaking about right here, a lot of these things can't be seen today when we look at the map because the Red Sea also has split more and has become a sea where it wasn't that way. So what Moses is showing here is from the record that was preserved. You see, there were Egyptians who worshipped Yahweh, who worshipped the one God, who worshipped the true God, you know what I'm saying, before the, the Egyptian form of Catholicism, you understand, and other denominations and state religion and other things came into the picture. You understand, and began to control very carefully the the spiritual life and turn the true spirituality into a religion. You know, it's like Catholicism when we talk about Catholicism today. Catholicism will say that it derives its origins from Christ, but yet if we study the teaching and testimony of Christ and see the practices of Catholicism, we don't find it in the original Christ. So just as there was the original Christ. And nowadays, there's all of these denominations, so-called denomination, counterfeit, counterfeit Christianity, churches, and, and, and sects, and cults, and all of this kind of stuff. And none of them, they can all be looking at the same Bible, but none of them agree. All of them are saying, we are the way, the next one is not the way. That, that, that should tell us a lot right there, because they truly all are disqualified. They all are illegal Jehovah worships. You know, and this is what the scripture speaks about the Antichrist and what Paul talks about another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. This is the reason why you still have many Christians today talking about Holy Ghost. A ghost is not holy. Ghost is a whole different reality than spirit. Ghost is not the same as spirit. But anyway, as they say, I digress, you know, saying off of the main point right here, but here is the first place that we find Ethiopia in this Bible. You understand? Now, Ethiopia in this Bible is the Tobia, the archaic name for Ethiopia, 
which very few Ethiopians know. There are Ethiopians who know this, but still the 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 popular um the popular story is told that it was the Greeks who who named them, and it's shameful for us as Ethiopian Hebrews at home and abroad to continue in that half truth. Yes, the Ethi yes the Ethiopians were were named, you understand, according to the Greek way of interpreting this reality of this ancient people, the Tobians. But if we look biblically, we find there's a land that's not identified, and it's called the land of Tob. The word Tob is very important because in Hebrew, Tob, or in modern forced Hebrew, Tob means good. It means good. So Tob means good. So it's a land of good, or the land of Tob. The archaic name for Etiopia is Tobia, or the land of Tob, which in the Hebrew means good, or the good land. Now what's interesting, in Genesis 2 and 13, we have Ethiopia, or Etiopia, written. But if you go to um, uh, 2.12, the verse before, it says this, and the gold of that land is good. There is the delium or the pearl. There is the pearl. Make a note of the pearl because the Kibbutz and the Gas speaks on the pearl. The delium is the pearl. There is the delium or the pearl and the onyx and the onyx stone, the black stone, the precious stone. So the bdellium, the the pearl. And the onyx stone is in this land. But the key thing is this. It says, and the gold of that land is good. Now, gold in ancient Egypt was called, some say it was called noob. Some say nob and noob, as well as the people were called the golden people. You understand, which is reflective of, we can say, the, the various shades of black people, of Ethiopian um, people. But it uses the word good in connection with the land. The gold of that land is good. And then we have Tobia or Ethiopia in the next verse because it's identifying. Moses has given us some key signs and indication from from his his summary, you understand, and even properly, you understand, properly writing the histories of the of creation that had become confused in certain Egyptian and in the ruling Egyptian priesthood of that time. The ruling Egyptian priesthood was similar to the Jews of the time of the Moshiach Yeshua, of the of, of the of the Moshiach um, Yehoshua, Jesus Christos. The Jews of that time were the holders of the religion, but they were denying the people access. You know, sent into the real truth and keeping them caught up on ritual of, of do, do, and don't do. You understand? Keeping them caught up on ritual. And the same thing was happening in the Egypt of the Israelites during the time of Moshe and Musa. Moses was able to have an epiphany. That epiphany that Moses had and his experience as well as his education, both in Egypt as well as in Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Median. Median actually was a province, you understand, was a province of the ancient Ethiopian Empire, Median. Median was one of the regions, like when they say the Queen of Sheba. Yes, she was the Queen of Sheba, that's where she came from, that's where she began her rulership, but that was also a province of this ancient empire of the Tob or Tobia or what we know as Ethiopia in ancient times. After all, we have Nimrod or Namrud, which led the Ethiopian and black presence as far as Assyria. And so we even have the black Assyrians like Abraham. Abraham was an Assyrian or Osarian. Osirian, black Hebrew, or Hebre, because that was his spirituality. That was, for lack of a better word, his religious denomination. 
you understand? He had crossed over from low degrees, and now he was going through the initiative process. And so he had to go down to uh, Egypt. You understand? He had to go down to Egypt. Now, we're going to discuss that um, a little bit more as we move on. Now, there's another, there's another reference that we want to bring into this, and this is from the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. This is from the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, and it's defining Tob here. You could tell. Some Buna. All right, so it's defining Tob here. Now, Tob on page 660 of the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, it says Tob, which is this right here. Tob, right? Tob. This is it in the Hebrew, and this is Tobiah within the Ethiopic, that Shemitic or Semitic or Shiyun, that language of the elect. And now this, as we go further, will link directly into the ancient Horus or the Cherui, the chosen. You understand? The elect of God, the chosen of God, the named of God, the point of God. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And Shem or Shem, Sim means the name means the name. But name also has an important, there's an important definition, a context of that word that needs to be understood. But here on Tob, Tob is defined as good. It means whole, in the sense of whole, like holistic. In good health, it means healthy. It means wholesome. It means fear. It means pleasant. It means beautiful, it means much, great, abundant, benign, benevolent, kind, well-disposed, upright, honest, joyous, happy, fruitful. Now here's what's very interesting about the definition of Tob, of the meaning of Tob, and the connection with the description of the ancient Ethiopian, the ancient Ethiopians. The Ethiopians are described as being a good people, a whole people, a, in good health, a healthy people. We're talking about not, not the, the, the careless the generation um, who have committed the great transgression against the Siyume Gziave, against the elect of God. We're talking about in antiquity. You know, so we're talking historical in our divine heritage. Ethiopians are called these very same things, the beautiful people. Abundant, benign, benevolent, kind, well-disposed, upright, upright, honest, joyous, happy, fruitful. Now, when they were called this and identified as this sort of people, even the Greek said in Homer's Iliad, said that the Greek, um, and Homer was an Ethiopian too. Let's just put that right out there. Homer was a black man. He was an Asmari. His profession was and Asmari Sarah. You understand? This is why we have Homer's Iliad. You understand? But in Homer's Iliad, he says that the gods of the Greeks, the Iliad, you understand, of the Greeks, would journey from their holy place, their Mount Olympus, just to dine, to eat with regular Ethiopians. I, I tell you, that injera and that wet and, 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 and the meat meat and the um, the Berbere, you know, the Berbere, should I say? The Berbere and the Kemem Kemam and the Quanta probably too, which is so enjoyable. Don't forget the Roman. You know, it's so enjoyable that the, that the Greek gods left their mount called Olympus and they would journey to Ethiopia. Not to sit down and eat with their kings and, and their rulers, but to eat with regular people. To go to regular homes of regular Ethiopians. So the Greek gods, as mighty and powerful in all of this storytelling that the Greeks tell us about, Homer, the Ethiopian, tells us that the Greek gods, they love nothing more than to dine with the Ethiopians. Why? Because they were a good people. They were in good health. They were wholesome. They were pleasant. They were beautiful. You know what I'm saying? They were benign, benevolent. They were kind. They were, they were well disposed. They were upright people. They were honest. They were joyous. They were happy. They were fruitful. And this is the reason why the Greek gods left 
the Mount Olympus to dine with regular Ethiopian men, women, and and children, and to eat in Jera and 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 you know a wet, you know what I'm saying, a woman, and probably some aunt as well too. You understand? Who knows? You understand? But it goes on to say that the name of the land that this in the Bible now, if you want to find this, and let's put this, make a notation of this. If you want to find this place mentioned in the Bible, you can go to uh, Judges, Judges, the Shoftim, 11, chapter 11, verses 3 and 5, for a, a reference to the land of Tob, the land of Tob, because the name of the land, this is the name of the land in which Jephthah or Yah Ptah, Jephthah is Ptah, Yah Ptah. You understand? I don't know if we have enough room right here, but if you do a little etymology on the name Jeff, Jeff, uh, they have Jephthah. You understand? But really, it would be Jah Ptah. Jah Ptah. Sound like Jupiter. You understand? Well, the Greeks, that's how they interpreted that. You understand? You'll find that a lot of their mythology is just a reinterpretation you understand, of the ancient Ethiopian Egyptians' mysteries. You understand? But anyway, it's the land to which Jephthah fled when his brothers drove him from home. So a man named Jephthah, in the book of Judges 11, 3, and 5, he fled to this land of Tob when what? When his brothers drove him from home and the land where he lived until his people came to him to lead them in battle against the Ammonites. So Jephthah would flee when his brothers drove him out. You understand? Because his, his, his mother was not one of the main wives, so forth and so on, and there were some allegations about her and and so the other brothers, you know, that there was that, that whole family, that family, um, a family, a negative family affair. Anyway, Jephthah was, was driven out. He fled to the land of Tob. He fled to ancient Ethiopia. He fled to a portion of the ancient land of Ethiopia, known as the land of Tob. Now, if you go and look up, look up. If you don't want to want to accept or believe what we're saying, then look up for yourself What do, where do they call the land of Tob? Where is this land of Tob? Where is this, pray tell, look, at, look, look it up for yourself. Where is this land of Tob? They will tell you that it's an unknown. They're not really too certain about where the land is. But now, metaphysically speaking, Tob, which is at the root of the archaic name of Etopia, before the Greeks, you understand, BG, see this was the name of ancient Ethiopia, and we're going to coin this right here, we're going to call it BG, and BG means before Greeks, before the Greeks, so before the Greeks, in the, in the time known as BG, you understand, Etopia was the land of Tob or Tobia, because Tobia is the archaic name for Ethiopia. Well before well before the Greeks, and then you do etymology on this, you find that this is Tobijah or Tob and Yah. Yah, once again, the true God. The true God is attached both to the archaic name and the more modern name Echopi Yah. Echopi Yah. Tobi Yah. You understand Yah or Ja is attached right there, but metaphysically, Tob, which means good, or in modern Hebrew, Tov, Tov Ma'od, Tov also means good in the modern Hebrew sense. It's a consciousness, a labona, of that which is good, wholesome, honorable, upright, joyous, and true. Also, it's a consciousness of abundance. So it's interesting that Ethiopia in the progression of time and since even the great transgression would go further and further away from their own roots and would, would, 
would adopt instead of going to their own sources where they'll find Tobia as the archaic name for Ethiopia, they instead would say that Ethiopia come from the Greeks. So they are saying that the Greeks who are latter-day white people, they were very much um, white people who, who on certain levels were able to carry a certain amount of civilization that they were taught by the ancient Egyptians and the Kamites and the Afro-Asiatic people and the Ethiopians. You understand? This is why in, in Eurocentric culture, the Greeks is the foundation for, for, for white civilization, for European civilization. Because for white folks, they were comparatively um, civilized. You understand? This is why Europeans often go back to um, um, the Greeks. But we don't have to go back to the Greeks because Ethiopia was before the Greeks. In Genesis 2 and 13, you find Ethiopia mentioned. You won't find Greece mentioned. You don't find Greece mentioned at all. You understand? So Ethiopia was already named before BG, before the Greeks, and its ancient name was Tobia. And Tobia represents a consciousness. It's a consciousness. So as Ethiopians and black people begin to recognize the true archaic name of Ethiopia as being Tobia and reference Ethiopia, Ethiopia to Tobia and the land of Tob, guess what? We will also see a consciousness shift because the real meaning of Tob is good, but good in the sense of wholesome, a wholesome consciousness, an honorable consciousness, an upright consciousness, a joyous consciousness, and a true consciousness. And also, and this is the key right here, this is the key for famine mentality, black folks and Ethiopians, and the rest of y'all that are scared to come into covenant with the true and living God and his Christ, in his kingly character, is it also is a consciousness of abundance, not of lack. As Ethiopians began to bow to the Greeks and the Western pressure and forget their own roots and culture and say Ethiopia was named Ethiopia by the Greeks instead of Ethiopia, you understand, was named Ethiopia from Tobia and the land of Tob, as it appears in the Bible, both in Genesis 2 and 12 and 13, as well as Judges 11, 3 and 5, when it mentions the land of Tob. And whenever you read in English and it says that a good land, a good land, it's saying a Tob land, a Tob land, it's qualifying that land. You know what's similar to it today? You know what's very much similar to it today? I just thought of this. This is a good point. What's similar today is when you hear people say it's like a utopia. You know, you notice how they use utopia, which sounds a lot like Ethiopia. They don't want to tell you that, well, Ethiopia is named Ethiopia because it was a utopia. They don't tell you that. They tell you some stuff about burnt face, burnt eyes, or something like that. You understand? And it doesn't really make too much sense. A ten, A ten Ops. So how come they don't call them A ten Ops here? It, it makes no sense. Anyway, in the same way in the Bible when it talks about a good land, that Yahweh would bring the true and the faithful into a good land, a Tob, a land that was Tob, is qualifying that land, even the promised land, you know, and even when we look at old Israel, so forth and so on, is being qualified by the Tobia in the very same way that they qualify an ideal situation, a utopia, which is a play on the word Ethiopia. E Ethiopia, utopia, utopia, Ethiopia, 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 utopia, Ethiopia, Tob, Tob, Tobia. You, you can see the connection. The connection is there. So what's very important is that Tob, the land of Tob, Tobia, the true etymology, the true etym, the true stamp, the true item, the true seal, you understand, of this consciousness. Because the consciousness to be able to recognize the true roots of Tobia, once you recognize that, it's a consciousness of abundance. 
So all of, gone are the days, you understand, of the disobedience, the great transgression, the rebellion against the king of kings. Gone are those days, you understand, when the consciousness has, has been lifted up. You understand? This is the rise of the black messiah. It's the rise of the Christ and his kingly character in our consciousness. You understand? And that consciousness is good. It's wholesome. It's honorable. It's upright. It's joyous. It's true. And it's also a consciousness of abundance, not of famine for disobedience, because it says the rebellious, the rebellious dwell in a dry land. The rebellious dwell in a dry land. It, it is very clear in Psalm 68, the very same psalm where it says, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God after princes come out of Egypt. Now, everything that is good is contained in that which Tov signifies. Everything that is good, everything that is good is contained in that which Tov signifies. That is very important right there. Now, there's a reference to say, see Jephthah, but it goes on to say, in the significance of the Tov, of the Tov, the Tovia, the Etopia, the Utopia, you understand? In the significance of the Tov that is mentioned in Second Samuel 10, 6, and 8, at least, the consciousness of good must be centered in outer seeming instead of truth. So we have another mention of Tob. And let's go to this mention of Tob because it might shed some light on, on, on the present uh, uh, careless Ethiopian predicament. We go to Second Samuel. Let's go to Second Samuel quickly. You understand? Um, Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 10, verses 6 and 8. Second Samuel chapter 10, verses uh, 6 and 8. Here we go right here. It says, um, it says, verse 6, And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Bet Rohob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and King Maka, a thousand men, and uh, a thousand men, and Ish Tov, 12,000 men. So somebody named Ish Tov. So Ish, Ish means man or male in that sense, as opposed to Isha, which means female in that sense, but Ish Tov. 12,000 men. Then it, so it mentions Ishtov. Ishtov. So it says here that Ishtov right here, it says in the significance of Tov that is mentioned in 2 Samuel 10, 6, and 8 at least, the consciousness of good must be centered in outer seeming instead of truth. So it was an outer seeming. It, 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 it was a, a reverse on, on the real inner sense. They didn't have the inner sense, but were in the outer sense. It's like today, most people judge by appearance. And if you judge by appearance, you're not judging by the inner sense. You're judging by the outer sense. And if you judge by the outer sense, you're, you judge falsely. You're judging falsely. So it's very important to see the root, the etymological root of Ethiopia is from Tobia. And... Um, we hope that this can be of uh, use and assistance. And there's much, much more. There's much, much more that's contained in here, but we're going to pause for the cause and allow one to take this, take this down, take this information down, down for themselves, take some notes on this, and we'll pick up on this. But what's significant is that the true etymology of Ethiopia does not come from the Greeks. But BG, before the Greeks, before the Greeks, it was Tobia. In the Bible, we have the land of Tob. In modern Hebrew, they say Tov. You understand? They, they pervert the Beth, 
you understand, and make it a vast sound because the leading uh, European Jews are the Ashkenazi, the Germanic, and the Polish uh, Jews, and in their non-Hebrew native languages, they speak like that. So it was only natural for them to try to twist the, the Hebrew to reflect their particular way of speech. But tov, tov, it means good. And this is at the root now of Ethiopia, BG, Ethiopia before the Greeks. So more to come, my brothers and sisters. Take, take, take good notes.